it's uh it's nice to see you come come on in take a seat my name is Cass. my name is tease and welcome to author's note don't like don't listen <laughs> tease have you watched or read or partaken in anything fun this week so i started a new fire emblem three houses file but yeah, tell me about it. I don't refer to it as Fire Emblem Three Houses file. I just go, I'm going to go hang out with Claude. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been driving everybody crazy, but I'm having a fun time. I also told Cass that Sylvain wasn't real and he got mad at me. <laughs> he's real and he can hurt you. But I meant it as like he's not real in the game. Like, you know how the janitor in Scrubs wasn't supposed to be real, was supposed to be like imaginary. That's what I meant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But I got very defensive and said Dorothy isn't real either. (laughs) It was really funny. I'm so sorry about that. But that's about it. What have you been... Oh, actually, I made my mom watch 8th grade uh, with me on my birthday, which was a really fun time to watch together. Yes, happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday, a moment in teastery. It's 26, babes. I am losing my health insurance. (laughs) I was gonna say. (laughs) Rest in peace. It's okay. (sighs) It's okay. I, she'll come back to me somehow. What about you, Cass? Have you been partaking in any media lately? Well, so this is actually going to be a very fun segue into our topic oh. for this week. But before I do that, I did watch the third season of Agretzko, which was so good and so wonderful. I watched, I watched it, that. too. Yeah, I watched it while I had the flu last weekend. So I just kind of laid in bed in a total daze and watched Haida fuck up his life further I, which is always really fun i watched it at work it, it was really <laughs> slow at work so i just watched all of it at work <laughs> well i mean it's short too it's like yeah. 15 minute episodes yeah. yeah and if i had to do something like i could easily pause in between episodes and stuff like that so it wasn't that big of a deal i mm-hmm. the work day was really slow so nobody judged me but um yeah. that was a wild ride of a season i mean i don't want to give spoilers since it is still a new thing but uh Boy, howdy. That sure go- was a season. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my my two, like, go-to Netflix recommendations for people when they want some slice of life stuff is Agretzko and Ralakuma and Kaoru. So go watch both of those. They're really good, especially Ralakuma and Kaoru. Second season win. Um, but aside from that, I took an interesting trip over the past two weeks into two very different properties which are both very, I mean, they're two different properties. So I watched The Old Guard with my my best friend, and that was really fantastic. It's a movie on Netflix with Charlize Theron, and there is a implied lesbian couple and a direct on-screen visible gay couple, which was fantastic. It's a really fun popcorn movie. Definitely recommend. Um, it's a little campy, but it also does like a great job of subverting some more like harmful tropes and kicking the white saviorness kind of in the ass. And then the other one is I watched the Game Grumps play through all the runs of Undertale oh. because I had I knew nothing. Well, I knew some things about Undertale. I knew Sans Undertale. That was all I knew. Um, <laughs> That's all you so, really need to know. Mr. Undertale. That's not true at all. <laughs> That's not true at all. As a, it's a phenomenal <laughs> game. As an Earthbound and Moon RPG remix fan. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> I've never played we Undertale in my life. We get it, your niche. I, you know, okay, so I didn't directly play it. I did watch people play it. Um, but watching people play it made me want to buy it for myself. I... I wholeheartedly believe you would love that game, Tease. It is Mm -hmm. funny and clever and has some really amazing gameplay mechanics. But our topic for this week is what makes a fandom last. Okay. Which we're just going to be talking anecdotally Mm -hmm. and kind of with our own experiences. But I had never gotten into Undertale because it was so overwhelming at the time which it kind of exploded onto Tumblr. Okay. And in contrast, the old guard... If Tumblr were still, like, the dominant fandom space, I I truly believe that the old guard would have had and garnered, like, a massive following. But I only saw the old guard on my timeline for maybe a week 
probably half a week more generously. And it was a few blips of people drawing fan art of Charlize Theron with an axe, because how could you not? And then it just kind of disappeared. And no one talked about it. And no one is talking about it. Which, sometimes that happens, yes. But... I found it strange and odd and it's like this is the kind of property that would have thrived with a community space and it just doesn't have one anymore and i think that kind of gets into the idea of like what twitter has done for fandom both good and negative a lot of negative (laughs) and we can talk about that this week but yeah i recommend undertale very fun also the game grumps do a really fun playthrough of it love those boys (laughs) love that whole team um Undertale has been on my radar for a very long time, obviously. Mm-hmm. We all know who Sans is. Mm-hmm. But, um, I... <laughs> I mean, I was a longtime Homestuck fan, so I appreciate how far Toby has come. And mm-hmm. I am, like I was mentioning, I'm a really big Earthbound fa- fan. I really enjoy Moon, and both of those games are heavily a huge influence on Undertale. And then... Uh, not to get like deep emotional, but in 2017, my cousin passed, and one of the last conversations the two of us had was him recommending me Undertale, and I recommended mm. him Earthbound. So it's been one of those things that I keep wanting to play, but I don't mm-hmm. know if I can play just yet. If you catch mm-hmm. my drift, so yeah. it's there. It's in the it's in the forefront of my mind, but also like. There's so much I do know about Undertale that mm-hmm. I will probably die if I play it. <laughs> so maybe one day. I also am, like, only a semi-gamer. <laughs> pick, a, pick a side tease. <laughs> <laughs> this whole week has Cass been roasting me about where I land on the gamer scale. And um, so I don't know. It's just one of those things that I'm not 100% sure if I actually do want to play just yet. But with the yeah. old guard, could it be that the Netflix algorithm has to come into play here with this movie. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Well, and like, that's, that's also an interesting thing to bring up because there was a series that was done by the Wachowski sisters called Sense8, which Mm -hmm. ran on Netflix, Yes, which had a pretty sizable fandom following. It again had visible queer relationships. It had black uh, and other people of color in lead positions. So like, really like fantastic diversity and representation and like a bomb soundtrack and like a really interesting idea but netflix didn't promote it and didn't advertise it on the same way that they did what was the competing show at the time um there was like a show that oh it wasn't 13 reasons why but there were there were shows on netflix that were getting tons and tons of promotion and um what was the other one? Was it Orange it, the, is the New Black? Because I know yes, a lot of people yes. complained about The Get Down being canceled after two yes, seasons as that's well. that's what I was thinking of. While yeah. Orange is the New Black had like five and it just sucked after season three. Exactly, yeah. And like was was so very apparently like harmful in some of the messages and things like it promoted. Like it made a shit ton of anti-Semitic jokes mm-hmm. that people were really uncomfortable mm-hmm. with. And it like refused to acknowledge the existence of bisexuality, which people were like, mm. but yeah, I mean, time and time again, shows will get canceled on Netflix after their second season, mm-hmm. because at that point, Netflix has seen how much profit it will garner them and doesn't see a point. It's cheaper for them to do a new production of a totally new series than to continue production, I think somebody said at one point, Mm -hmm. which is really frustrating and worries me as we get into, like, season two of The Witcher, and I'm like, please, please, please don't take this from me, please. Well, (laughs) with a lot of, I mean, not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but a lot of times when a Netflix show makes it past the second season, if it even gets a second season, it becomes, like, oddly anti-socialist, anti-communist propaganda always, and always ends up becoming this weird, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Propaganda, yeah. It becomes this weird propaganda for capitalism. Like, if you look at what's happened to Stranger Things and how Stranger Things has progressed and Mm. how um, if you can't really find a way to be appealing and useful to some kind of weird propaganda for Netflix and to continue to consider purchasing Netflix, I've noticed, it kind of gets knocked down a peg and gets canceled. I mean, for instance, Tuca and Birdie had a huge 
following and yet it was canceled and i think that's impartial because netflix just didn't know how to shoehorn their own opinions and wants into a series yeah and i mean now toucan birdies thankfully got picked up for uh adult swim but like a lot of times if netflix can't shove their agenda into it like with how i mean let's be real slowly but surely orange is the new black did become like this weird shoving of like this is what we think about uh the lgbt community this is what we feel about Mm -hmm. uh people of color this is how we feel about uh, religion besides uh christianity i'm sorry my brain's like dead today and so on and so forth and i feel like a lot of times if netflix can't promote a certain type of message with their series then they're not gonna continue to pick it up despite how much fans support it and how much fans care about it which is what essentially happened with sensei uh one day at a time and stuff Mm -hmm. like the get down as well and i guess even in that case tuca and birdie and all of that jazz so Mm -hmm. but it's it's very weird because netflix is essentially i mean it's a media conglomerate at mm -hmm. this point and so it's it is so much like it has to be everything to everyone and offer all of these options without offending people. And I mean, just recently, uh, kind of in the news, there was this huge backlash because the movie Cuties, uh, which comes out on September 9th on Netflix, um, it's by a black Sengalese woman. And the movie is about the over-sexualization of young girls, prepubescent girls, and them imitating sexualized actions without even understanding the context of them and so i guess the movie is about like a twerking competition and so for netflix's promotional art they picked a scene from the movie where it's like these girls in hyper sexualized poses in these like kind of skimpy costumes as opposed to the actual official movie poster which is like these girls running down the street like laughing wearing like bras and underwear over top of their clothing and people were furious Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's just like it's so difficult too because netflix is made up of of a bunch of subsidiary studios and while it is a my cat is making noise welcome to the table it's guest expert eskel yeah i Netflix both can't be too left-leaning and can't be too right-leaning because then they'll lose, like, a considerable portion of their market in Mm -hmm. either direction. Mm -hmm. And they're also across the globe. They're not just centralized in the United States, you know? So it's... Yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, it's a a mess. And I mean, I... And people who have talked to me for more than five minutes know this. I am extremely anti Disney for that very reason. Yeah. Uh, I hate the conglomerate that Disney holds for that very reason. And I really firmly believe that with the centralization of huge conglomerate companies like this, that we are losing independent thought and viewing within media. And there's a reason why independent cinema exists, and there's reasons why there's. Mm -hmm. antitrust laws put in place during the 60s and the 20s and so on and so forth and it's time that we need to recreate those laws and get rid of those loopholes for this very reason Mm -hmm. and but to go we we went on a huge the mouse common domain yeah (laughs) the mouse should be common domain and with the create so for instance as we're recording this mulan just came out and so to segue back to what makes the fandom last the fact that mulan is not only behind the disney plus paywall but then also an additional exclusivity paywall creates a barrier against viewers which in turn Mm -hmm. also affects a creation of a fan space and uh I'm kind of piggybacking here off of an idea that a friend mentioned on a podcast. If you guys don't listen to Playing Dress Up, it is a cosplay podcast that my friend Joe hosts. And I was listening to an episode with another mutual friend as a guest. Her name is Chelsea Seashell Cosplay. And uh, Joe was talking about how a fan base lasts definitely if you consider the amount of money you put into it and the amount of time Mm -hmm. that you put into it so there's an investment aspect to fandom if you think about Mm -hmm. it and with mulan you are forced to pay a certain amount of money we all know what the Mm -hmm. original mulan is like we all know what that movie is about you know and then for you to force yourself to invest in it you're gonna care a little bit more about seeing it if you're gonna spend your 30 dollars or whatever to see it so 
and that goes the same with time as well for instance you so for instance you you really care about the witcher games right how yes. much time <laughs> have you put into the witcher games i have put i don't know the the number off the top of my head i so i I don't replay games very frequently, but mm-hmm. I have frequently replayed The Witcher. I think I'm on like my fourth replay of it. There we I go. don't even necessarily go for different routes. But on top of that, I've put hundreds of hours into each of those playthroughs. And then I've also played the DLC multiple times, and I've read the books, and I own the Omnibus collection. Like, There we go. Yeah. <laughs> you put your time and money into this. And when yes. a game is 60 hours and you have to buy the $60 game on top of the mm-hmm. $400 machine to play the game on, you're going to be a little bit more invested as opposed yeah. to spending your $10 a month for your Netflix subscription and you can finish a whole entire anime, a 13 episode anime in a day if yeah. you really wanted to. Well, you know? And I mean, there's also on top of like the investment of your money, right? There mm-hmm. is also a level of, with exclusivity of the sort of like, uh, how do I want to put this? The the appeal of something which is limited in quantity and holding that experience like with Promare, which I think we're going to end up talking about quite a bit. But because Promare was like a limited release and you had to go out of your way and like a lot of people like there, there was a hype because it was limited mm-hmm. and because only a certain number of people had seen it. Mm-hmm. And so like there was an immediate desire for people to be a part of this thing. I mean, it's it's the same reason people go to, like, midnight releases and shit like that. Yeah. It's, it's because they want that, like, mm-hmm. they want in on that premiere experience mm-hmm. before anyone else can get in on and it. And as well with Promare, there was this prestige of something that you already trust. People mm-hmm. love Trigger. Uh, I personally think Trigger is just nice to look at. I don't really think any of their stuff is substantial. But, um with knowing the studio and trusting the studio there's already this built-in fan base of people who are going to continue to see it anyway and yes. then when they actually did get to see promare and they did get to experience it then that became <laughs> and when promare is literally just like word trigger studio the movie literally with like if you all haven't of seen it referential jokes it's really just Gurren and Logan made for 2020 you know and there's also this appeal with Promare that the characters are still, I always refer to it as Barbie dolling because a lot of times with characters that aren't super strongly made, there's enough gray area to play pretend with them, which oh, is yeah. what builds a fandom really well, which builds fan culture, head cannons, fan fiction, so on and so forth. So with mm-hmm. Promare only being a 90 minute movie, but there being a base enough personality to each character, it set up the perfect experience to make a fan base and to create a space for both analysis and meta, as well as going one step further with creating headcanons and fan fiction. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, like, that's the thing, right, is if you're... If your property is offering characters, it seems like more often than not, the two character types that people get very, very invested in are either, sir, please stop your jingling, um, are either background-ish characters slash characters with very little nuance, Mm -hmm. or characters who are so heavily developed that it is very easy for a viewer to pick up on their voice. When you fall into this like sort of middle gray area where a character is neither totally fleshed out but has too many character traits for you to really kind of like play around and make them super mutable and moldable like people aren't generally as interested in them as characters Mm -hmm. but i also feel like in situations like with i I was talking about this with a friend earlier with idol anime it's the perfect Mm -hmm. space to get attached to because these characters are just one step above like the bare minimum a lot of times it's like well but like that's kind of what idol characters like it is essentially like buying a doll i mean you're buying a jpeg right yeah but it's like going to walmart when it would be like okay here's the new barbie line it's 
it's Miss Barbara Millicent Roberts, and she's in these different outfits this time. What kind of story are you going to make up for her? Exactly, like, exactly. And that's why mm-hmm. people love them, because they can project on them, they can attach to them. And when you can project and attach to them, there's definitely, an, it's an easier way to relate to the character and get attached to them, and then buy mm-hmm. merchandise for them, which then encourages the producers of those characters because sometimes it's not even a producer of a show uh to build games around them to build movies to build shows around them to build more merchandise so then you kind of get into the cycle of buying more merchandise and caring more about the character and Mm -hmm. it is it traps people so well which is why wailing and wailing so if you don't play gotcha games wailing is people who spend exuberant amounts of money on a Mm -hmm. gotcha game and what you're gonna if you care about the girl you're gonna end up wailing for her anyway you're gonna put money into the series which then you're gonna be invested once again because we talk about time investment and money investment and then if you do play a game for them you're going to be invested time wise as well because you were sitting there and tapping on your phone playing this game so Mm -hmm. truly if there is going to be a trigger gotcha game it is fucking over for everybody (laughs) I think one of the things, too, that has really sort of changed the atmosphere and environment for fandom as a whole, too, is the migration from Tumblr largely to Twitter. And Twitter has created a very non-hospitable place for lasting power in fandom. Yeah. The way Twitter is structured is incredibly rapacious and built upon uh, an algorithm which prizes consistent and frequent posting which makes it very, very difficult for artists to maintain visibility. And I'm going to speak, like, generally speaking about artists in general, but, like, that includes fan artists as well. And then when we move to Twitter away from Tumblr as, like, a prime platform for fandom, we lost so much that I miss constantly like i cannot find fan edits on twitter there's no there's no appropriate tagging system Mm -hmm. where it's like i can go through and look at all the posts related to that twitter's search function is is it's it's defunct it doesn't work it's it's awful instagram is also kind of the same and instagram being like oh everything can only be square fuck off instagram I'm tired of the one to one like ratio on every single one of my pieces of artwork. Mm-hmm. Please mm-hmm. stop. I um, I miss the tagging system as I miss tagging so much. As someone who was not a fan artist and more of just a casual reblogger back in the Tumblr days, I missed being able to consistently find fan art of the things I cared about, and I also miss finding people who talked about the same thing over and over again. Because with Twitter, mm-hmm. it's just usually it's either the most popular tweet or the most popular what uh the most recent or whatever but it's really it was easy to see a pattern of who was posting about what via tumblr Mm -hmm. and then also with tumblr you could see who people reblogged stuff from and then from there you can make friends and make followers from there and i feel like with and there's an argument that twitter has these features but they're not it's not the same it's not you know it, it is not in any way like the same kind of construction twitter's not meant for images twitter's not meant for video Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. the the nature of twitter it was made for and this this infuriates me every single fucking day it was made for political debate which doesn't actually yeah i mean that's that's the idea is that twitter was made for discussion so that you could frequently discuss things with people but that doesn't work because you're limited to so many characters and i mean we got more characters like a few years ago it's like what 240 now or something 280 there 280 there was a time when it was 140 right and it's like you cannot communicate a clear point in that amount of characters with enough nuance to actually satisfy a conversation. Mm -hmm. So then Twitter has also had the effect on fandom and Mm -hmm. communication as a whole in social media of being a much more negative, hostile place. Mm -hmm. Like, to degrees which, like, we joke about the call-out culture of Tumblr, but at least on Tumblr you had the time to, like, curate and write a full-length blog post that wasn't cut off and that you could, like, really neatly format as opposed to Twitter where it's like, if I want to read, like, a miniature article, I'm talking, like, 200 words, I have to cycle through a shit ton of tweets. Mm -hmm. And, like, Mm -hmm. in a thread which is not optimized for viewership, and now Twitter is making it more easy and more convenient than ever to 
to silence people who you may disagree with and like for good and bad you know like there's some benefits to that but there's also some really huge political implications that come with that and it's just like we I I think people talk pretty frequently now about how it's like why is everyone arguing like the huge boom of anti-culture comes with Twitter because you have blockchains because people are constantly arguing because there's not as much nuance it's not as easy to see who a person is via their presence on Twitter it is it is just like a much more hostile landscape and it it, it's made fandom a lot less fun like Mm -hmm. At least to me. And like, yes, I know, Tumblr still exists, but we all know it's not the same. It's also overrun by Nazis and porn bots. And like, uh, every day I'm like, kind of want to go back. Yeah. I want to go back a little bit. I miss Tumblr big time. I, I never was a big Tumblr user. I never, but there was more community involvement in Tumblr. It was easier to make a group of friends and i mean by the time tumblr discovered and rolled out group chats i was like i'm 25 years old i don't want to talk to 15 year olds (laughs) but (laughs) if tumblr included group chats like in 2013 or something like that i would be going off the shit and people talk about stuff like uh pillow fort and stuff but i mean who uses pillow for i really haven't seen that many people like i know about it i know it exists but how active is pillow for? i i've been teasing the idea of slowly migrating over to pillow for for a long time and it's it's invitation only right now where mm-hmm. you can pay for an invite code which i actually think is kind of clever mm-hmm. um to help them pay for their server costs at the end of the day it's i can't even say like we just flock to wherever celebrities go because like there weren't celebrities weren't hyper visible on tumblr Mm -hmm. which was actually really nice but (laughs) uh, uh, k-pop stands in your twitter mentions are like the really really fucking long tumblr posts that would go by where people would do like rainbow gifts of that like one post where it's like like and reblog if you support gay rights K-pop stands aren't bad. I don't have a problem with K-pop stands as a whole. I, I had Stand a K-pop culture... k- says at one point, guys. I, I understand. <laughs> K-pop's good. K-pop's bopping. It, it bops. Like it's good. Yeah. It's just sometimes the fan base, just like all big fan bases, when you're an outsider, it feels really weird to you if you're not a part Man. of it. Man, you know what else fucking sucks about Twitter? Tell me. People can't just post their fic. I mean, people try. They post images of their fic, Mm -hmm. like screenshots, Mm -hmm. which is the worst thing in the world. And I understand. I understand you're trying to promote yourself and get yourself out there. Mm -hmm. But they are so, so inaccessible. And, like, they almost never have alt text. And, like, even if I'm on a phone, I have to scroll from one side to the other. And if I'm on my computer, oh, boo-hoo for me. My resolution is too high. But, (laughs) like, I have to zoom in so far to see that text. And it's just, like, it doesn't work. It doesn't. I miss fan edits. And, like, any time I have to look for a reference of, like, an actor or a character's face for a commission or a painting or something, I always go back to Tumblr. And I search on Tumblr in their tag because I know I'm going to get a curation of, like, good, flattering mm-hmm. images that are, like, nice and, like, they're well color graded and, like, sometimes they're animated so I can go through the different frames. If I go to fucking Google, it's like, here's a really popular picture of, like, Willem Dafoe and he's going to look god-awful because he's on the fucking red carpet. And it's like, <sighs> also, don't fucking tell me to use Pinterest. I hate Pinterest. Pinterest is the bane of my existence. I hate Pinterest. I will say this. When I I cosplayed Midsummer last year. I actually made a Hail Mary post on Tumblr. I was like, I need pictures of Danny's shoes. Which one of you gift makers did it? And mm-hmm. I tagged it Midsummer, and lo and behold, within 20 minutes, somebody linked me to their own personal GIF edit, and I was able to detail my shoes like a pro mm-hmm. because somebody was nice enough to link me to one of their Tumblr posts. And I obviously thank the person, and then I proceeded to reblog said post as well, yeah. because I know in the grand scheme of things, like, what's a reblog? However, it, that's the least I could do. And with t- Twitter, you have this setup where it's like, good luck, bitch, because you're truly just at the mercy of whoever sees your tweet within that algorithm. Yeah. You used to be able to, tra- you can't track uh, 
tags in Twitter, you know? People don't even tag things in Twitter half the time unless you, like, mm. search result it. But always the people who end up, like, scrolling through the searches are always weirdos. And they always, like... <laughs> Get on your ass for no reason. And it's just like you were saying, Twitter is such a hostile place. And here I am typing brackets around words so people can't find it in the searches. Like, Mm -hmm. and then just Twitter's blacklisting system is also awful as well. I just, mm -mm. I think this episode is us just realizing we need to get on pillow for it. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Perhaps. (laughs) Perhaps. <laughs> this episode is supposed to be, you know, what makes a fan yeah. of but it, it turns out it's just Tumblr. Yeah. No. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think those are key, though, is like the idea of a platform which allows communication. And I, I like there are people who make Discord servers and mm-hmm. stuff, which is like. I'm so I, afraid of Discord I, servers. Yeah. I don't want to be seen. Um, I don't want to <laughs> talk. I just want to shout into the void of my own right? blog. And then if. But. But that's like a huge part of like what allows a fandom to endure is people who can quietly engage yes. if they are just reblogging or retweeting or sharing because okay hi I think a lot of people don't realize this if they're not an active content creator but if you just like something you're essentially only you get to see that mm-hmm. someone might by the by the grace of the gods see it on twitter they might see that you liked something which also terrible feature twitter dude, fucking get rid of it's it awful. i don't need somebody to see my likes <laughs> that's why we lost army hammer y'all were fucking rooting around in his likes leave him alone but if you retweet or reblog something you are then putting eyes on it of all of your followers Mm -hmm. and so every time somebody reblogs or retweets something that shares it with a whole new audience that the artist doesn't have anyway if you really like something retweet it i don't care if it doesn't match your aesthetic please you never know who's going to see it and be like i want to give that person a job please that's real important we all struggling out here in 2020 Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) to go back to the actual topic of the episode (laughs) there's also (laughs) something to consider uh anticipation with Mm -hmm. i think netflix has also equally fucked up how fandom spaces work because yeah with netflix obviously everything is just out in one day however i think part of the reason why things like star trek has survived for so long is because there is a constant once a week Mm -hmm. there's a backlog for you to consume if you are a new follower and there's always the promise of a new season a new series a new movie yeah. somewhere down along there's the cliffhangers road. there's anticipation yes. people can speculate make conjecture mm-hmm. there's like plot threads that people like if you only have one new episode available to you each week and like maybe 12 episodes a year maybe all right like you're gonna spend more time with those episodes and like the amount of times i would go back and like rewatch something like the episode from the week prior while waiting for the episode for this next week to come out for Mm -hmm. just like any number of things like the amount of detail you're able to catch then and really appreciate and it sucks because yeah i i think we are a culture right now that is very focused upon immediacy and accessibility and netflix did try to do stuff where they're like oh you know we'll release like one episode every week and like i'm guilty of it oh i'm gonna wait for it all to finish and then watch all of it and it's because like it's that's also just my adhd brain Mm -hmm. of like it's much easier for me to set aside one giant block of time than one small block of time each week but that that we're now missing out on that is is really kind of frustrating and i i do wish we would go back to that because like man if i just got to watch one episode of the witcher every week instead of watching it all in one night and now i just gotta wait for like a year or two i wish i didn't have to wait (laughs) i wish i had something to keep me going (laughs) and then i also feel like there is this issue of when something is dropped all in one go you end Mm -hmm. up becoming obsessed with this one portion of a series and then when the Mm -hmm. second season of something or the third or the whatever season comes out and it doesn't go the way that you planned you're gonna hate it and (sighs) i (sighs) hi guys i was really into voltron legendary defender (laughs) and i watched season one for times before season two came out and i watched all of season two in one day out of excitement and then i never touched it again 
because of how miserable season two made me. And dare I say, it's because I ended up latching on the wrong characters because <laughs> those characters really got pushed into the dirt. But um, boy, howdy. I mean, let's talk too about how queer baiting can sustain a fandom. Yes. And I, I don't, I do not mean queer subtext. There is a difference between queer subtext and queer baiting. Mm-hmm. Um, they are, they are very different. Mm-hmm. Queer baiting is what Stephen Moffat did with the Sherlock series. He was more than aware of the fact that there was a huge fandom following and that had existed prior to his show. Like Sherlock fan fiction has been around for a very long time, but he was well aware that there was a large following that was invested in Sherlock and Watson being together. And he used that to constantly tease jokes or the idea. And I mean, openly mock fans who thought that they would end up as an item as opposed to queer subtext a la lord of the rings with all male characters like let's just be honest um and then there's queer text where it is actually in the narrative whether that be more subtly or more overtly um that scene in great gatsby in the elevator y'all that's real mm -hmm. that's real your teacher might talk not talk about it but that's real (laughs) like it's confirmed (laughs) by scholars and i also think there's a huge issue of the relationship between a fandom and a creator and a fandom forcing a creator to change the story Mm -hmm. uh I mean, which is another thing that's mm-hmm. kind of been brought about by Twitter mm-hmm. because like the creators, I mean, obviously they want to go and they want to create and they want to engage with space spaces. And like, it's more easy to contact them directly via Twitter and be like, Hey, retweet my fan art. But that's also created kind of an, an uneven playing field. And I, I am immediately thinking of like, there's just a lot of things that have happened in fandom history in the space of like the last five years that directly relate to fan relationships with creators because of creators saying one thing or another or being put on the spot or asked to address something that has caused like massive explosions Mm -hmm. within fandom spaces Mm -hmm. and caused like huge division huge conflict etc and it also Um, in turn ruins part of the story like for instance uh Literally just last week, uh, Shonen Jump property had its first popularity contest, and the character that won the popularity contest was actually killed in that chapter when the (laughs) announcement (laughs) was made. (laughs) And I mean, (laughs) and people were like, "Who was it? Who was it?" Um, it was for. Sorry, guys, if you care about this, but it was for Chainsaw Man and. Uh, oh, I don't know what that is. It's, it's, it's really good. I kind of like it. But mm-hmm. also at the same time, it really does feel like a shonen version for middle school boys of Doro Hey Doro, which is really unfortunate. But um, <laughs> so, I mean, I guess we could cut that out. I don't want to give spoilers to people who care no, about yeah, it. I'll cut that out. But, I was um, personally curious. <laughs> but um, when this was announced, when the popularity contest winners was announced and then the new chapter came out, people were like, damn, this mangaka really doesn't care about what their fans think and that's so weird to me because like this is the mangaka's vision this is the writer's ideas Mm -hmm. and story and why should the fans dictate what the story becomes just it's not a choose your own adventure like and that's that's a really a really difficult argument that has been happening a lot in like the game community in reference to making games more accessible and people who pride themselves on you know like being incredible at like Soulsborne games and they're like well those games shouldn't be made more accessible because the difficulty is you know in the fact of like it's it's baked into it it's what makes the game that game and like I'm not I'm not going to come down I am going to come down on one side of that and is that I think all games should be made more accessible I think anyone should be able to experience art mediums and it's it is just cre- like right it's created this really uncomfortable relationship where Creators obviously are making things in part to satisfy their vision. And as you get to a more corporate level, that's going to distill quite a bit. Um, And it's not going to become quite as potent. It's not going to be one singular person's vision anymore. But at the same time, I think it's really twisted for fans to come around then and say, hey, I really enjoy the thing you're creating, but I'm the one paying you in like part and parcel to make that. So you need to satisfy me in that. And it's like, well, that's not... 
how that really works. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't, I don't know where we end up on that conversation. Like, you know, if you really enjoy somebody's artwork and you're subbing to their Patreon and you're helping to pay their bills, is it appropriate for you to step forward and say, you need to make more of X? And it's like, no, it's not. Fucking unsub from their Patreon or whatever. But it's just like... Eh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, even sometimes it's not even the fan base, but it's actually the producers of the series. Yeah. I mean, none of us want to admit that we all watched the first five seasons of Supernatural, but we all sure did. And yep. I mean, Supernatural is supposed to end at the end of season five. It's obvious. It's that's how it was supposed to end. However, let it go. <laughs> yeah, just let it be. For I mean, I guess you're gonna keep beating the dead horse as long as it spits out money. But how can you just so obviously disregard a creator's wishes? It's like. With what Spongebob is becoming now, now that Steven Hillenberg mm-hmm. is dead, Nickelodeon is like, well, this is a cash cow for us, so we're going to keep doing this. And it feels so disingenuous and lifeless afterwards, and that's what Supernatural became. And I guess, yeah, that's what the fans wanted. Not even all fans. A good portion yeah. of all the fans. Like, some fans I think there's always going to be a split in a fandom of people who are more invested in quote unquote the original vision mm-hmm. and people who are just more interested in more content mm-hmm. no matter what that content mm-hmm. is. And then also begs not the not saying question, that's a good or bad thing, but you know And then also begs the question, is being a different type of fan a good thing? I mean, let's be real, there's always people who just genuinely like something and there's people mm-hmm. who always interact with a fan base. And I mm-hmm. feel like there's a huge difference between a fan who just watches a series every week or whenever it drops and maybe has a casual conversation with their friends about it when they get out, go out to lunch or something like that. And there's the person who consumes fan media, c- makes their own media, buys merch for it, goes to conventions, yeah. goes to meet and greets and stuff like that. And at the end well, of the and day... Then there's- there's a bigger split then too between fans who buy merchandise, license merchandise, and fans who engage specifically in fan media exclusively. Yes. And like there there's a very different vibe between those fans sometimes mm-hmm. and some of them in spending their money on a franchise feel entitled to a say in it. Mm-hmm. Star Wars fandom, I'm looking at you. <laughs> and I mean not to keep going back to Supernatural, but I mean, when Supernatural was big, there was, like, the Gawishes thing, and there was all these Supernatural cons where people were... Fucking Misha Apocalypse. The Misha Apocalypse, and, like, it became embedded within other cultures. Like, Mm -hmm. there's no Dr. Seuss fandom, but there was a Onceler fandom, and why is that? (laughs) It's because they were just interacting solely with fan content. They weren't mm-hmm. interacting with Dr. Seuss children's books or the Dr. Seuss political cartoons or whatever the hell. Yeah. They were specifically interacting within the movie franchise, the base of the fan base itself, and the fan content and fan merchandise. And mm-hmm. how can a movie production company even recognize that they have a fan base when people in the audience are not actually actively participating in the root piece of media any longer and when does the original piece leave and the fandom become separate because the Onceler fandom isn't the Lorax fandom it is the Onceler fandom it is the one character well and I mean look at fucking the Snyder cut right like that would not exist if not for the immense giant outrage from people on Twitter just like directly calling for it and like accosting producers and harassing them via Twitter and being like we want the Snyder Cut and yes there will maybe one day be an episode just about the Snyder Cut and the fucking nightmare that this is and like the precedent it sets for this industry but this like that's not even like a fandom though that's people just feeling entitled to something and demanding something because the final product they got wasn't what they wanted and the same thing happened with mass effect and the same thing will happen over and over again i mean game as of long thrones as, like, oh literally my God. got erased after people didn't get what they wanted and i mean like the endless amount of petitions being like remake the final season and it's like shut up you don't want the final season remade you don't you don't no. like it's it's <laughs> I mean, uh, Star Wars. 
the, the trajectory of that trilogy, of the newest trilogy, was changed irrevocably because of the negative backlash by super fans over The Last Jedi and over Kelly Marie Tran. John Boyega and Kelly Marie Tran got foisted to the background and made into negligible characters because of racist shit boy fans. This is not the... <laughs> this is just a rant episode at this point. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But like, it, it's... There are... There are so many aspects to what makes a fandom last, and a lot of it too is just lightning in a bottle. Like, mm-hmm. there's I can't tell you why the fuck the Onceler fandom exists. I mean, there's there is certainly aspects to it where like that exclusivity and being a part of an event, like I think that's huge for the Homestuck fandom. Mm-hmm. I think being able to like be there when like something just drops out of nowhere, that's huge. Mm-hmm. I also Um, think that there's a certain type of camaraderie that comes mm -hmm. within fandom. And, I mean, if it's, like, especially towards a movie or a celebrity or something like that, like, obviously you're never going to meet an anime character. You're never going to meet a video game character. Chances are you're never going to meet a celebrity either. I met Kratos. He's my dad. He's your dad. The penitent one from Bosphemus is my dad, so (laughs) we all love our dads. Um, But there's a camaraderie between fans that you can't have that relationship with these characters, but when you care about other fans, you end up almost having like a foster system in a way that like Mm -hmm. you can still talk about this thing that you care about with them and they feel similar to you and they shared personal experiences and they shared the experience of these characters and these celebrities and stuff like that and you kind of build together this universe in a way whether it be via headcanon or through meta or analysis and stuff like that and you discover new information together and you're there when things release and it becomes in turn a real relationship despite the relationship that you have to these characters and series. And I feel like with that, that builds the urge to keep continuing to talk to these people and to build with Mm -hmm. these people and stuff like that. Because if it's just you, I mean, how many times has people just lost interest in something because just not a lot of people care about it and they just don't, they're just not exposed to it as much as they are exposed to other stuff. Every property in the world has one person, one singular person, who that is their hyper focus interest, and that is all they care about. That's me with Beck Mongolian Chop Squad, baby. <laughs> I've literally been published to talk about this before. Yeah. But, it, like, this... <sighs> Fandoms last longer if there's a larger community. Mm-hmm. And when there's a larger community, you're ostensibly going to get more production of fan media. But it is a lot more taxing for creators to make things when... The things they make only stay visible for maybe a day. Maybe a day. I mean, Um, I know, for instance, Beastars is a wonderful example of this. When the Beastars anime mm -hmm. came out, people were like, oh my god, I love this. This is gorgeous. I'm so into this. And then within a week, it disintegrated. Two weeks tops, it disintegrated. However, I know people who are into the Beastars manga and were into it before the anime, before the anime was even announced and afterwards. And maybe it's just because I've been reading it for over a year now, so I met people who cared about Beastars before an anime even was a twinkle in our eyes. But Mm -hmm. it's so obvious who was a fan of it just for the anime versus who was a fan of it just for the manga. It's like we had to wait and suffer for this, and then we got the blast of the anime itself, and now it's just back to only having manga content. And there's such Mm -hmm. a obvious divide of who fans were before and after simply because there's just not a visual aspect to it right now yeah and i mean like that's part of it too is that if you can't i I, i'm thinking about just like being on tumblr and how you know you could sustain your own micro community of people who are really interested in something because fan art would just like happen across your dash or you would go into the tag and you'd go really far back in the tag and find old fan art and you'd retweet it and suddenly that's making the rounds again and everyone's like oh I really liked that thing I'm also going to go back in the tag and look at this kind of thing that doesn't happen on Twitter it doesn't anyway Twitter's the death of fandom (laughs) I mean it's not like there there are still people out there kicking on like live journal and delicious and stuff like people are still using defunct platforms but they don't have the reach that they used to mm-hmm. and i think that's the most frustrating part and my i think if you would ask still exists i mean my space i'm coming back baby we're gonna revive i wish there was a button that we could just nuke all the content that's currently on tumblr and start fresh and it would be a golden day and we would allow nipples again oh my god 
Tumblr that was the worst decision <laughs> for me. I mean, that I ultimately just, killed Tumblr because it really did. I don't want to say like the sex worker community, but a lot of people lost their income because of tumblr you know not <laughs> just like a lot of people are losing their income because of bella thorne <sighs> jumping onto only fans mm-hmm. thank you for cosplaying as a sex worker for a day bella thorne fuck off yeah <laughs> I, uh... and just like with tumblr making this platform suddenly more whatever family friendly i guess you want to call it in turn that ruins it for fan artists that ruins it for sex workers and then the algorithm didn't even work so now mm-hmm. random people were getting hit and getting shadow banned essentially to use yeah. a twitter word and it's just there's you obviously you do need to police some things like you obviously mm-hmm. you need to be policing pedophilia and incest and uh racism and homophobia and the nazis and all that shit and companies media companies need to make more dedicated and respected task forces specifically for combing out harmful content mm-hmm. um i know what is it uh fucking y gallery or yaoi gallery is coming back um and a lot of people are furious about the fact that they're allowing shotokan stuff like and i mean yeah it, it's you can't you can't set up these giant playgrounds or let me do this you can't set up giant public pools and then not have a lifeguard present and you need to pay that lifeguard and you need to make sure that lifeguard is able to take breaks i mean it's like qa testers in games everybody mocks qa testers because it's an entry-level position but those people are there to make sure that the content you're paying for is actually playable and accessible and works the way it's supposed to so that it's not getting harmfully overrun by Nazis so that it's not having like constant streams of gore in the search tags to like purposefully harm people yeah that's but fucking Jack Dorsey says nah Nazis are allowed and it's like hey Jack (laughs) And I just, I don't understand why you want those people in your communities anyway. And I mean, unfortunately, there is, there's a really fantastic video essay by Folding Ideas on YouTube about um, a video platform that sprung up because of YouTube's policing of content, right? And the thing is that whenever you open up a new alternative platform, which allows for i'm gonna say more diverse ideas i think we all know that some ideas that are in that are really harmful awful ideas that should not be had but when you have a platform that springs up in competition that allows more diverse ideas the first people who are going to join it are going to be the people you kicked off of your ship so when youtube banned a bunch of nazis they all went over to this new platform and that's the community they made and they built And I think the initial route on Twitter a lot of times was a lot of people from alt-right platforms and it has kind of set the stage and Jack doesn't want to lose his OGs. And I mean, I also don't think that he's brave enough to come out and condemn the alt-right because let's be honest, some of the ideas he has are shared by them. Mm -hmm. And not to mention with, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook one of his biggest <laughs> fact-checking groups for Facebook is, in fact, an alt-right newspaper. I mean, yeah. we've all seen the video of AOC absolutely smacking Mark. I almost said Jesse Eisenberg. Mark <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man, put in the time. He put in the time. <laughs> Poor Jesse Eisenberg. Mark I don't know him. Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just absolutely destroying Mark Zuckerberg for condemning these people and just letting them run around on a playground. And, I mean, opinions are allowed, but when opinions are presented as fact, that's when it becomes an issue. And this has nothing to do with fans' Opinions are allowed, but opinions... (laughs) Opinions are, I like chocolate ice cream instead of vanilla ice cream, not... This person literally doesn't deserve to exist because of who they are. Like, and can't help. Mm-hmm. Like, that sort of thing. I I mean, and that's that's just a much bigger conversation. But, like, that also exists and contributes to fandom spaces because it's impossible for fandom not to be touched by the political culture of the world. 
And when your platform allows people to partake in these political platforms, you're going to get weirdos, you know? Mm-hmm. You're well, going to get like, exposed. Attack on Titan, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I literally saw a YouTuber made a comment in a video about how they didn't enjoy Attack on Titan anymore because it had become really weird and really alt-right and a bunch of people in the comments being like, um, actually, no, it's not. It's, like, really interesting. And it's like, I need you to go back to your high school English class when your teacher taught you that there was meaning in the curtains being blue and you thought that was fake. That lesson was not about the curtains being blue and what that meant. That lesson was about learning to read subtext and identify propaganda. (laughs) Like, your creative ideals and the properties you are engaging with do not exist in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. There's always... They don't. And I mean, oftentimes, shit just is picked... To just be picked, you know, like, I mean, for my birthday, a friend drew one of my OCs and appropriate enough, her name is Cass. And I was like, damn, the only two friends that I have named Cass are both men and they use he, him pronouns. And then I was like, huh, I have two OCs named Cass that both use she, her pronouns. I was like, huh, I never thought about that until two days ago. And I mean, sometimes people just pick shit out of their ass, yeah. you know, but a lot of times... There's a lot of reason why things are allegories, things are symbolism. And when you Mm -hmm. look at something like Attack on Titan with a series that has an experience of imperialism and has a history of colonialism and has a history of genocide. I mean, quite literally, there are only two Asian people left in this whole entire series. And you don't think that's some sort of symbolism Mm -hmm. i mean not even and i know like whenever we rip on attack on titan i always love to bring up the fact that the attack on titan editor quite literally killed his wife so you know that shit is rotten to the core no matter what but that just shows the type of person that approved of it in the first place like Mm -hmm. you well and i mean so hi i went to art school and one of my huge frustrations was always with my classmates complaining about the fact that they had to take humanities courses the humanities <laughs> courses you are made to take in college are there to make you a more thoughtful and well-rounded individual and yeah some of them fucking suck but there is context and nuance to almost everything in this world like even to that statement there is context and nuance and so it is really important for you to be careful and thoughtful otherwise you end up with people making fucking Hatalia fan art when there's a natural disaster like <laughs> it, it's there so that you can learn and that you can remember that there is a world that exists outside of your very limited scope and so that you don't have a negative impact or that if you do have a negative impact you know how to perform actual harm reduction Mm -hmm. (laughs) so to go over this episode (laughs) (laughs) because it went a lot of different directions and i think maybe maybe few uh, maybe every few episodes we'll just have a talking point and kind of go off because we didn't have any notes and we didn't do any research for this one this is just i read like two articles conversation time yeah (laughs) i just read like two articles one was about how much a girl loved jake gyllenhaal and i loved every minute of it you know (laughs) and so I mean, obviously, I just feel like it's, there's no right way to make a fandom, but there are Mm -hmm. elements. Wrong ways. (laughs) There are wrong ways, yeah. There are elements that do help it last, whether it be just the sheer number of people involved in it, the content itself being malleable to, that's a good, you know what? That's an excellent word instead of playing Barbie. As if the characters are malleable, that is the bet that ends up being such a good thing for Mm -hmm. fan content creators there we go that's why there's a huge gumby fandom he's so malleable we love him he's so wiggly (laughs) clay (laughs) but if you have any observations of your own that you would like to share with us i would really encourage you to kind of reach out and share them with us at authors pod at gmail.com we would love to hear your thoughts on really any of the things we talk about Mm -hmm. or if you have more questions or suggestions for ideas that would be super welcome if you're interested you can follow us on twitter at authors note pod we have a card there where you can find lots of information on how to support us we are on coffee if you would be interested in more directly fiscally supporting us that would be a huge help it's just authors note pod again 
we would love to hear from you. We're having a lot of fun making this podcast, and it's a really awesome thing to do, so we would like to keep doing it. If you're interested in finding more of my work, you can find me on Twitter at Valhathella. That's at V-A-L-H-E-T-H-E-L-L-A. You could find me at Vicunad, V-I-C-U-N-A-D, which is my Twitter. I'm also on Fresh Podcast Market, which the Twitter is just fresh pod market and by the time this episode comes out this will be like five weeks old already but i'm going to be on an episode of playing dress up and playing dress up is available on all platforms to say that same way that we are so you could easily just go on spotify or apple podcast or whatever and look up playing dress up and you'll see uh probably a picture of my giant ds somewhere <laughs> and if you are interested in our theme song that was made by composer James Wyulo and his band camp is jamesy.bandcamp.com. Our cover art was made by Nyaliest. You can find her on Twitter at Nyaliest, N-Y-A-L-L-I-E-S-T. If you enjoyed the episode, share it with a friend. Tell people about us. That would be hugely appreciated. Until next time, thank you so much for joining us and stay safe. Have a good one, guys. Bye.